Hey everybody, it's Matt Johnson here. This is the latest episode of Real Estate Uncensored. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, if you like this type of content, I want to encourage you to do a couple of things. So number one, subscribe on YouTube. Uh, all of our uh, video hangouts will go there as well as our shorter videos and even when we do an audio podcast version, we go ahead and upload a video version to YouTube so it's easily accessed there. But if you prefer all of your stuff to be audio, if you like to listen while you drive or work out, whatever, check us out on iTunes and Stitcher. And we have a special guest with us here today. Obviously, I'm joined by Greg McDaniel, as always. Greg, how are you doing? Hey, Matt. I'm doing fantastic, buddy. You know what? You and I were talking off air. Our guest today is one of the legends in this business, and I cannot wait for him to just download the knowledge onto everyone listening to this thing. <laughs> okay, I'm going to take, I'm going to take, uh, 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 I don't know what, I'm going to take umbrage with that. First of all, when you call me a legend, that means I'm an old white dude, which is <laughs> Probably true. And uh, what was the other thing that bugged me? I don't know. It'll come back. You, you, just, you just don't like being called a legend because you are. You're very modest, Patrick. And that's what we like about you the most. Uh, okay. Okay. If that's what you like, then fine. I'll go, I'll go with modest and humble. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. That's fine. Okay. So you're not a legend. Um, just no, I'm not. Just very, very good at what you do, and you've been doing it for a while. We will not say how long. 31 years. 31, 31 years. years. Okay. <laughs> so uh, so we're going to pick Patrick's brain uh, because, obviously, there's a lot of uh, – a lot of people that that tune in that are not necessarily looking to break into the you know single family three bed two bath ranch market. They would rather do condos, apartments, townhouses, uh, those type of uh, that that type of real estate. So this is something Patrick obviously is very familiar with. So Patrick, give us a little bit of uh, you know for those that don't know your background in the in the New York market. What types of properties you specialize in? The types of clients that you really like to work with. I like to work with rich clients with lots of money. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, I work with everybody, uh, and it's about developing relationships for me and not about numbers. So um, while you know we did 100 million in volume last year, um, which is pretty which is pretty awesome, uh, we work primarily with, I'd say one of my specialties are townhouse sales, uh, and then the vast majority of our sales are co-ops and condos in Manhattan and the first half of Brooklyn. Hmm. And you cool. said you're not a legend for $100 million in volume. Most people dream of a million dollars or $10 million. You're like, yeah, I, I did $100 million, so it's whatever. It is whatever. It is whatever. <laughs> <laughs> what are you like? Where are you ranked on Forbes' list? Like number 10? No, I was like 121 that year. Damn, man, that's awesome. So, well, he was going to no. say, you're, Patrick, you're up against uh, like large teams because they're a lot of times lumped into that same category, right? So you're going up against people that have 15, 20 agents? Well, yes. They'll do many more transactions as do. You know, when you're in a luxury market like L.A. or San Francisco or New York, your average sales price is going to be a lot higher. So when in those marketplaces the you know the my average sales price moved up to just under 2 million this year you know uh, uh 60 70 80 transactions goes a long way that that way yeah. and yeah. obviously there's a lot more competition so when the numbers go up per deal the number of agents per market go way up so last year in new york uh i read that there were over 14,000 residential real estate brokers and our agents of and of that number, there were only twelve thousand seven hundred transactions. So that meant everybody was doing less wow. than on average than one deal. And since I did eighty two deals last year, hmm. uh, that meant eighty two people went hungry. Or I hope they had a second job. <laughs> they probably do have a second job. You know the stats on this thing. You know a typical agent only does two deals a year at thirty. You know average income of thirty five thousand. So, I mean. They're going to go hungry no matter what. They don't work. Yeah, yeah. So, so we do handle all sales prices. We we sold. Uh, we just got board approval, and board approval is some, a part of selling a co-op in New York because you can't just sell to anybody. The buyer has to be approved by the board. So we just sold a ground floor studio in the West Village that the living room was eight feet ten inches by seven feet nine inches. There was a Pullman kitchen. The the one closet was narrower than my shoulders, but there was a, a window in the bathroom, and uh, that went for two ninety nine, and that's really really low end for our market. But you know what's interesting about by handling that relationship, um, 
we got another referral from the broker who brought the buyer that was not from the same marketplace, and she just referred a $6 million listing to us because she liked the way we did business. Wow. Wow. It's the power of her relationships, you know. Yeah. I think, Patrick, see, you and I have come from the same way of, of thinking back with the Star Power days, and it's all about building relationships. It's not about the shiniest tools. And, you know, we looked at our board, the one you see behind me right now, and uh, all of our listings up there and the ones that we have recently closed, we, we went through with the team like you guys, and we, we checked them all off. We're like, how do we get that one? How do we get that one? How do we get that one? Every one of them was a referral. Yeah, it's really fascinating when 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 I started tracking my numbers and doing my metrics, just about 90% of my business was was well, I'd say 70% of my business was coming from uh, referrals, whether they were broker to broker referrals or sphere of influence uh, referrals. Uh, about 30% was coming from expireds, but. Um, I think one of the mistakes that we do is we keep on going after leads from places that we're not doing well in, and that's probably not a good plan. A better plan is to maximize where you do really well and then try to grow as you can in other areas. But uh, focusing on where your business comes from makes a lot more sense. So a lot of people, when they're just starting out in the business, they're going to do numbers. They need to contact as many people as they can, and that's where Zillow, Trulia, online leads can be awesome. But once you get established, strengthening those relationships is really about what the majority of your work can come from, and it's much more rewarding. It is. You know, what is something that you do for your database? How do you stay in touch with your database to stay, stay uh, top of mind? You know, I use viral marketing videos and other stuff like that. What, do you use something similar? Uh, I use Contactually for my CRM, and then I put everybody that's in. I have about 2,700 people. No, I have 3,700 people in my database. And then they go into different buckets depending on how often I want to contact them mm -hmm. and with different programs. And then every day, when I, Monday through Friday, when I get up, I click on Contactually, and it says contact these 5, 10, 15 people. It's usually, it's usually about 7 per day for me. And I'll either call them, write them a handwritten note, which is always great because uh, nobody's doing that these days, so people love it when you get a handwritten note, mm -hmm. or... Um, I'll email them, and you know, every once in a while, I only send things or only contact people when I have real value. So suppose their name comes up, and I go, "God, I got nothing. I got nothing. What am I going to do?" So I'll think, "Okay, they live in Chelsea. Let me Google Chelsea, and what comes up under Chelsea news? Find an interesting article that's something new that's opening up in Chelsea, or something that's happened with taxes, or anything, and then email them that link and say, "Hey, I was th I saw this article. I was thinking about you, and thought I'd just say hi." That's awesome. Yeah, that's a great idea. And, and Patrick, I'm curious. You know, going into the high end market, you talk about kind of getting established, and you know where online leads fits into that. Do you think that that's um, if you were a new agent starting out, or if you were kind of getting your feet wet, would you would you focus on like the lower end market and then try to move up, or do you really attack the high end first to try to establish yourself there? I would, I would. Do, well, it depends on who you are and who your connections are. So, if you were born on Park Avenue and went to all the right schools and was really popular and decided you wanted to be in real estate, I would not start in the low end. I would start with who my friends are. So, if you're like me when you moved to New York, you had uh, cheap ass friends. Then uh, you know I started selling cheap ass properties as, and as <laughs> you're from the Midwest, right, Patrick? <laughs> yeah, that's where I learned cheap ass. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I was uh, raised in Maryland and 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 did my undergraduate school and high school out in Missouri, uh, which is proof that I went there because I say Missouri, not Missouri. I, I was going to say, yeah, that's that's how you know it's real. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly how you know it's real. It's also it's also downward pretentiousness. You know, I could say Missouri, but it just sounds more real. Like I went to I went for a semester in school in uh in Barcelona, Spain, so I have to say it with a lisp. Not that that doesn't come naturally to me because it does, but um, <laughs> Barcelona. I dated a I dated a girl from Missouri in in college. And she lived in V E R S A I L L E S, Missouri, which should be pronounced Versailles, right? Mm -hmm. Versailles, Missouri. Yeah, that sounds about right. 
It's classy, isn't it? <laughs> oh, I feel classier already. Yeah, That's you, right. You feel Nothing really says classy like pronouncing all those L's. <laughs> I love it. All right, so uh, so you obviously broke into the market and worked your way up. Right. Now, what's t talked about? Uh, speak to some of the challenges of doing that. So, let's say you do you get your foot in the door. How do you then move up your price point gradually? Um, gradually is a is a good way of looking at it because you know if you can increase in my market if you can increase your average sales price by two hundred thousand every year that's a really wonderful thing. Going from say an average sales price of five hundred thousand to two point five million is probably not realistic, but gradually moving it up does make sense because people generally want to list with brokers who already have a success record within that price point. So, but there are some things that you can do that are very, very effective for going in to raising your price point. The first one is going after expires, and going after expires only at a certain price point. So, uh, we only on my team we only go after well, at least I for the expires for myself. We only go after two million and up uh, properties. Therefore. Um, even though I'm going to land less of them because there's fewer of them, my average sales price goes way up, but more importantly, my profit goes way up. So I don't have to do as many deals. If I sell one five million property, whereas the average sales price in New York is 1.2 million, then I would have to do four properties to match that. So it, it increases profitability dramatically. So expireds is a great way of going. And another great way that I've seen, we did a recent podcast. I have a uh, podcast called... Uh, uh, Real Estate Success Rocks uh, uh, podcast, and uh, on it we interviewed Nate Martinez from uh, Glendale, Arizona, and he talked about how he uses strictly direct mail to go into a higher priced market where nobody had any dominance there, and by doing consistent luxury mailings, uh, every three months to that marketplace, he's now the number one high-end broker in those targeted niche markets. Um, I thought that was pretty brilliant. The first year, the rate of return is not as good because you're having to expend a lot of money. I bet you his expenses to profit was about 35%, but second year, that came down to 25%, and probably by third year, he'll get that down to a manageable 10 to 15%. Yeah. Still pretty good to start at yeah. 35 and then work your way down. I mean, that's not you know that's not that bad. It's not, but to me, that's a I don't know. 35% yeah. seems like a lot of money you, because because not only are you spending 35% on just marketing materials, then there's the time associated with it that you could be doing something else that right. that would be earning a better return. Okay, so going after expires, uh, doing mailing specifically into higher end luxury markets. Anything else, uh, maybe on the relationship side, that people can do to gradually increase their, uh, their well. Price? We also recently interviewed Greg on our podcast, and as as uh, he says that he likes to hang out at bars. And, <laughs> and, um, what and, and, I find that very hard to believe. Hang out in bars and uh, meet people there, and you know, as long as you <laughs> hang out at bars that the average uh, uh, person there is of a higher wealth, then it makes sense. It would be a way for Greg to increase his, his price point by going to, a oh, yeah. better, going to a better bar. Oh, it is. You know, I'm, instead of trolling for women, I'm trolling for leads. I'm sitting there going, see, are they talking about real estate? Are they talking about real estate? They're talking about real estate. Yeah. <laughs> swarm, swarm. <laughs> You can probably do both at the same time, Greg. Oh, I, I well, I kind of, I tell myself I do them both at the exact same time. I'm like, I'm not here to meet women. Yes, I am. <laughs> well, how are you thinking about buying? I know that if you're a single female, there's a 19% chance that you're going to be buying sometime soon. So my odds are good with you. But <laughs> how are you? But what's what's the best way to get a hold of you? <laughs> so so let me guess. Your 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 uh, your viewership is mostly men. I don't know, actually. I, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm, being uh, I'm being obnoxious. I'm being obnoxious. After this episode, probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is wrong with this McDaniel guy? God, he's got problems. Oh, man, that's good. But, so, I mean, Patrick, you, it does bring up a le legitimate point, which is you can, you can go after it prospecting style or you can go after it relationship style. Yeah. And one of the things... And you can try to circle. And then one of the things that you do, like, for instance... Um, I act you know, I've been going to real estate conferences since 1996 when I joined Coldwell Banker that year. And, you know, I, I purposefully looked to make connections in, with people that were in 
uh, uh, towns that were feeders for New York City. So obviously LA, San Francisco, Chicago, or uh, any town in Connecticut uh, are all feeder towns to New York. And making the relationships with the luxury brokers uh, usually indicates you're going to get a higher referral from them than from the average broker. Not, not that I don't appreciate my relationships with all my broker friends, but, but you know, actively trying to associate with people who are selling uh, higher-end property is in your best interest to raise your average sales price. Going to Participating in a luxury mastermind, there, there are tons of things you can do. That actually brings up a really good point, Patrick. I, I, what I do is I uh, here at my brokers, I teach about going into your feeder markets. Just so people understand what that is, how did you identify your feeder markets and what do you do to prospect into that area to get the forward leads? Um, we're actually we're we're actually not I can't say that we're actually prospecting, but I heard a really great idea that we are starting to do. So um, uh, one of the things that we we've just began to implement is that when I travel now, we're going to look and we've done this just once so far with a decent result. We're going to look in properties. Let's say one of the buildings that we sell at is the Edge in Williamsburg, which is this really trendy building right on the river facing Manhattan. That's gotten it's now going like at eighteen hundred dollars a square foot, which is high for Brooklyn. Um, it's 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 getting it's it's getting it's Manhattan prices in some areas, and uh, so it's it's one of the buildings that we've targeted. So there's a lot of investors in that building. So what we do is is not only are we mailing just to the investors, not to the owners that live in the building. We're spe specifically targeting investors and their rate of return on deals that have happened in the building because prices have dri uh, dr risen dramatically there. Um, but when so we have the list of investors. When I when I'm going to travel to Seattle or San Diego or someplace, we'll look at which one of those investors live in those towns. We'll reach out to them and say, "Listen, um, I'm going to be in town. Would you like to meet for lunch or a cup of coffee?" That's hmm. awesome. So you go yeah. back to the relationship. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's you know that's a long term that's a long term process. It doesn't usually mean deals right away, but if you're in it for the long haul, it's it gives you the leg up on everybody else. And you can imagine how impressed they would be to get that phone call and say, "Yeah, I'd love to have a cup of coffee with you." If you really tell me what. Yeah, I mean, it's like even if it doesn't come through, even if you don't get together, that relationship yeah. is strengthened just by you reaching out. Yep, yep. Now, how does that affect you, like the absentee owner? How does that affect you on the prospecting side? I mean, 30% of your business is coming from expired. Do you find them, are they harder to reach in, in that, that type of luxury market? Finding expires are hard to reach altogether in New York because we don't have an MLS. So yeah. there's a lot of problems. We don't have an MLS, and we don't know specifically when leads have expired. Um, it'll it'll say something like permanently off the market or temporarily off the market, and one out of twenty times it'll say expired, even though they are. So we have to guess at it. So once, since most listing agreements are about a six month period in New York, once it's been taken permanently off the market or temporarily the market off in six months, then I go ahead and we make the call, and then we use a a, a, a service called People Smart to get phone numbers for them. Um, and the mm -hmm. quality of the phone numbers are, um, I, I don't know, I'd say about 80% decent, but they are, they're better than the other sources that we've used up to that point. The other thing that we've done, which, is, uh, really, which has really opened up doors for us, is that there's a chocolatier here in New York in Soho called Mary Bell, and they do really high-end luxury chocolates. And they have a laser printing system where they use... Uh, uh, a buttercream icing, but they make little miniature paintings on each one of the square chocolates. Mm -hmm. So um, we'll have two of the chocolates done to look like our company's logo core, and then two chocolates to look like my Patrick Lilly team. And then we, they come in a beautiful box. It costs me about 12 bucks. And then we mail them out to the expired listings uh, with a note saying something along the line of uh, uh, cookie cutter marketing just doesn't cut it anymore. Um, and then on the inside, you know, the hallmark of our success is creativity, joy, and precision. Um, and then inside the box is uh, a little note that says, wouldn't it be sweet to work together? And then my contact information on the back. So we're going after the people that, that haven't had success with selling their listings, is probably disappointed in the way it's go gone, and we're trying to demonstrate to them that uh, we want to give them value, that we do things differently, um, and that we want this to be a joyous process. What is happening is 
by just sending that out, it's not sufficient. Uh, we found that our appointments and the number of leads we get um, has skyrocketed, provided we just call them back. And they're more willing to take our call and be friendly when I say, hey, I'm the real estate broker that sent you the chocolates. Did you get them? <laughs> you, you can imagine that's much more, they're much more open to you than if I just call and say, you know, are you interested in selling your home or something like that? So it brings up a good good point. You know, what is that script that you use after you break in with the uh, with the with the chocolates? I mean, is there a script that you stick to that you uh, that you kind of work? You know, one of the things it was interesting because we did that we did that prospecting phone uh, 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 episode with you a couple of weeks ago, and it was and Greg is really the best prospector I've ever heard. So I don't even know why he's asking me these questions. Thank you. But uh, but um, uh, he's not in my marketplace. Yeah. <laughs> Thank God for that, right? Yes. No, I think New Yorkers are thankful for that. Not, not. not for, for, for there. Um, that can be arranged. They, they have things. We can ship them right to you. Yeah. In a I box of candy. In a box. In a box of candy. What was the question? Oh, what's my script? So, uh, one of the things that um, we have been trying to do, Greg, was to make things more fun and creative. That I find that I'm more inspired. I'm more real when I'm having fun and when I'm being creative. So consequently, I'm doing my best not to use a script. I'm trying to intuit either from their voice or their tone or just what's ever coming up to me ahead of time and which direction I want to take that phone call after I give, did you get my box of chocolates? Um, or did you like the box of chocolates that I sent you? I wanted to see how that conversation goes before I go into a script because um, I want this to be fun for me and doing scripts are not as fun for me. That's it's it's that's so interesting. A lot of the folks are just beating down our door, your door, everyone's door. To hey, what's the script? What's the script? What's the script? But your technique is completely genuine, and that's the that's the that's the quality. That's the you know the genuine quality of it. And people can smell a script a mile away unless you put your own style to it, like we talked about on your on your show. And I love the fact that what you're doing is you're going at it 180 degree different than the typical agent and that's why you're selling you know a hundred million dollars worth of real estate because you're not going hi you know my name is Patrick Lilly I understand your home is uh, not for sale would you like to list it with me they're like click yeah. jack you know jackass yeah. just saying, wow, this how guy long? Me. I mean how, how how much does experience and making it you know thousands of those phone calls is that a big is that a big you know reason that you're able to take that freedom with the call or could you have done that starting out and just start off with that freedom? Oh no, I I I, I these are the first times I've been making phone calls myself for expired listings. Before I had a telemarketer doing it for me. My first telemarketer was amazing. He was brilliant, 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 and uh, he did a really great job. Uh, he's actually working now for somebody who was on my team, Martin and, and and has gone out on his own, which is you know really beautiful, and I'm really happy for them both. Um, um, there were reasons that I wanted to separate, and then we hired a second telemarketer that was not as good. And I've and and both of them were saying things that made me feel uncomfortable from my set of values. Um, it's not that what they were saying was wrong. It was just wrong for me. And and I thought, okay, so for me to get really what I want, I need to, one, get over my fear of, of rejection. And two, I need to, this is a skill set that I can learn, and I want to figure out how can I be real and genuine and bring value to people's lives and do it by, by making the phone calls myself. So this is a new thing for me. I can't say that uh, I've been doing this regularly, no. Okay. I got a quick question, actually. So your telemarketer, a lot of people are always trying to cut costs. They're always trying to get that bottom line bigger. But if you go, like I, I've done it several times, you go get an ISA or a VA that's out of country, then you have a language barrier or a, uh, a you know verbiage that's different. It's not quite all American. Did you stay in-house, like have someone in your office, or, or did you go out of the country? The one that was great was in-house, and he got paid a really nice salary. Okay, and, and bonuses, really nice salary, but and it was worth it. He was worth it. That was going to be my point. I mean, we were paying eight dollars and sixty cents for a quote top notch ISA as an internal sales agent for everybody who who's not familiar with that. Um, basically, a, a virtual assistant as well, and we were getting crap results. I mean, absolute crap. And so what we did is we went and then and hired for a short period of time someone in house like you, and our results went through the roof. And so I mean I would like you I'd recommend you know doing definitely staying in house paying that extra dollar find the right person 
and get get that off your get it off your bucket list. I, I for that's what's working for us and has worked for us in the past. So I'm looking at myself on the screen. Do you see these like two things, these bags under my eyes? <laughs> do, do you do you I remember? Have no idea what we're talking about. Oh yeah, you do. So <laughs> you remember um, what was it? remember the Romulans on the on the later uh, Star Trek movies? They had those bony protrusions. Doesn't yeah. That, doesn't that look a little Romulan to you? <laughs> I, 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 mean, I take it. Wait, I take I'm, it. You're a Trekkie. What Star Trek? What? Yeah, I, the, wait, is that a show? <laughs> Am I dating myself? Am I that much older than you guys that you've never heard of Star Trek? I just, <laughs> no, we're no, that's, that's intentional. We're denying it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have okay. no idea what you're talking about. Never okay. watched Star Trek Voyager in my life. I don't know what you no. mean. Okay. <laughs> oh, so yeah. you like you like Captain Janeway then? Captain Janeway. That was. Are you kidding me? Growing up, that was the show, man. We watched every right. single episode. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was yeah. a good one. Uh, <laughs> No. All right, so um, let me ask you this, Patrick. So we were talking to another guy that's a little bit outside your market. Uh, Aaron Wittenstein is up in Westchester, and uh, he was talking about when he you know, dials on expires. I mean, it's taken him sometimes six months of nurturing to take that listing. Are you, is, that, is it similar in your market? Are you having to nurture that relationship yeah. for a long time? Yes, yeah, yeah. We, uh, uh, we find that many of them just aren't ready to move ahead. But once, once they've taken, that they're willing to take your call freely, then it's a totally different relationship. So, again, I just use contactually, you know, when they say, you know, when they say, no, they're not ready, when can I call you back? Four months, six months, two weeks, a year, whatever. Then I just stick it and contactually put it as a task, done, next, next call. Okay, so two, two questions on that. Number one, do you actually take their word for it, or do you cut whatever they say in half? Uh, no, and yes. I take their word for it and then subtract two weeks. Okay, all right. All right, second, <laughs> second question is on the follow-up calls, um, what, how are you providing value or what's your phrasing so that you're not just calling up going, hey, uh, are you ready to list yet? Generally, I won't be well. When the well, no, if the follow up call, the follow up call is I will not call them again until we've that we had that agreed upon time. So the call is generally, hey, uh, this is Patrick. I don't know if you remember we talked. You asked me to call you uh, this week about considering whether or not it's time to put your house back on the market. Uh, uh, for instance, I'm a lady that has a really nice house up in Harlem. Um, you know. We, we said, call me back in three months, call me back in two months. Now we're down, call me back to a week. So we're getting closer and closer for me coming to see her, and it's just uh, I just do it whenever she says she wants me to. Gotcha. Do you, besides the calls, Patrick, do you uh, do any kind of drip email campaigns? Do you do any kind of pop-bys, anything in person uh, to stay up with them? A pop by in New York. I don't think that's going to work. Oh, that's right. You, people get shot in New York for doing those types of things. I, 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 you couldn't even get past the doorman. I just, that's just, that's really a terrible idea, Greg. <laughs> You're gonna end up with bruises on your body and thrown out in the street, apparently. Yeah, that's not that's that's not a good play. Yeah, right, let's so take that off the table. And well, and you know, New Yorkers are so friendly; they would be really open to having you in their home too. I've heard so that. that. They don't. Yeah, they. I they, bet they even invite you in on a hot day and give you a nice glass of lemonade. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're living in an alternative. You've been to, you saw one too many Star Trek movies. That's what you. <laughs> Well, I keep on thinking about us, you know, pot smoking hippies out here in California. Everyone's like, "Hey, bro, it's cool. Come in, man. Let's hang." New well, York's no. like, "Get off my porch." Well, no, they smoke pot. They just tell you get the f off their porch. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> no, you cannot have any of my weed and get off my porch. Yes. <laughs> okay. See, Oh you, you you understand it totally. We, <laughs> so the other way, the other way, we what I'll do, and no, for for anybody, once I've made real contact with them, I'm not putting them in an email drip campaign. I just I find that stuff is crap. Mm -hmm. I find that you know, if you were a new buyer and you didn't know all the processes of a buying, putting a new buyer into a drip campaign makes sense to me because you're educating them on what it's like to buy in New York City, and that has real value. Putting somebody who's been a, a, a homeowner for a long time and I'm trying to develop a relationship by sending them an email drip campaign I think is counter, well, will defeat the purpose because I want to show them that I'm real and I care about them and that I want to give them value all the time. And a drip campaign, in my opinion, for the most part, would not be valuable to them. So what well, how I'll, many, uh, well, uh, okay, how many, like, let's say active, pro I guess, prospects are you working at any one time to where you can give them that level of personal attention? Oh, I only uh, in the number of phone calls that I make a day, um, they're under 15. Hmm, so okay. that's easy to do that. 
Yeah, yeah, much much easier. Um, now, uh, there's two different types of email drip campaigns. So obviously, you can do the educational kind, which, like you said, makes sense if you're educate, educating like a first-time home buyer. But there's also, you know, automatic updates on homes or that fit their criteria. Oh, Is well, of not course, something really of, feasible. Of, 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 of course, we always do that, but that's oh, okay. uh, to me that's not a drip campaign. That's that's uh, talking what, about like the simulated emails that look like they're real but really aren't. They yeah, were you know yeah. loaded up into an autoresponder. Yeah. Oh no, of course we two send, years ago. To every okay. buyer that's in our program, we 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 set, automatically send them listings just to stay in contact with them. And every once in a while, we'll get you know like two years. We've totally forgotten about the person. They go, I'm coming to New York, Patrick. Let's go see some properties. I'm going. Okay, let me just figure out who you are. <laughs> Like, I love that response. I get it too. Like, well, Greg, you know, you've been sending me all these great properties. I'm going, who are you? Yeah. <laughs> Where did I meet no. you? Oh crap! <laughs> I yep. see, de I see dead people. I see, I see dead buyers. There, <laughs> right? Good, good notes. <laughs> yeah, that's a good thing. Now, Patrick, what would, uh, I mean, what would you do uh, in the few minutes that we have left? I want to make sure that we get a chance to tell people about your real estate conference and stuff like that. Oh, but thank you. Um, what would you do? I mean, just give us a, a kind of a brief, you know, the classic question of you had to parachute into your market, you knew everything that you know, but you had no money and, you know, no connections. Like, how would you start from the ground up today? I would start with expireds. I would start with expireds, and I would start with calling anybody that I knew and letting them know that I'm now active in the New York marketplace, and if they know of anybody that's moving here or moving from there, can... Uh, can I please reach out to them? So I would get on the phone. Uh, you know, I'm sorry that I didn't do that earlier in my career. I didn't stay in contact with my earlier clients, you know, I'd say for my first 17, 18 years in the business. Hmm. And that's kind of hard to believe, isn't it? But it's true. How were you generating business that whole time? Were you, I mean, did you have more of a prospecting... It was the it was the Rom it was the Romulan good looks. That's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and that, you know, contactually for anyone who doesn't know what contactually is, that and Patrick with we use it as well. It is a fantastic system, and it allows you to stay in touch with people. They have pre-written emails. You can write your own emails, like he said. They give you reminders to co contact people. Uh, I, I'm sure you have this response when I use it. On a, well, I, don't, I should use it every day, but sometimes I just don't. But I get people responding. Like, they'll get back to me. They'll reach back, and you know, the conversation and the re relationship can deepen. So are you seeing people reach back to you the same day or in a couple of days after, hey, thanks for the email, yada, yada? Eh, sometimes, sometimes not. It's, it's <laughs> yes and no. So, But I don't know what's going through their mind. You know, they, mm -hmm. you know, I deal with a lot of high-pressure people in New York, and they may or may not really have time to send a five-minute email. So I, I, I don't take it personally until uh, they unsubscribe from something, then I know that I'm pestering them. Mm -hmm. But up to that point, I, 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 don't honest, I, I don't honestly know. But that's the biggest thing I would change. I would, I would, I would do more phone calls and more relationship developing, you know, than I did, because I I've sold over a thousand apartments in my career, way over a thousand. Mm -hmm. And you know, I bet you the first six hundred, I don't even have them in my database. Wow. Isn't I know, I know, isn't that shocking? Yeah. <laughs> it is. For a man that will love his relationships, you hated him in the beginning. Why? Was uh, because <laughs> I because I uh, the truth is the truth is is I honestly thought real estate was beneath me. I had an MBA from NYU. I'm a pretty smart guy. I really thought I'd be going into consulting at some point and not selling residential real estate. And after about the 13th, four, maybe it was the 12th year, somewhere between 12 and 14th year in the business, I realized that door was not going to open up to me and. If I want, really wanted to grow my business and take it seriously, I needed to focus on it as a business, and I wasn't doing that. The first 12 to 14 years, I was, I bartended. No, no, no. I quit bartending when I started real estate. I played a lot. Let's put it that way. I played a lot, <laughs> and, um, and I had a lot of fun. I was yeah. in New York. Yeah, well, you you got to you got to go, you got to go play. But that brings up the second thing right there. I mean, for not following up with folks, what was that aha moment? Was it a loss of a client? Was it a loss well, of a deal? Yeah, when, when, when they went to resell and they didn't even call me and they listed with somebody else, it totally pissed me off. And obviously, I wouldn't list with me either. I didn't stay in touch. Why should they list with me? <laughs> but I want to point out a really de uh, a point in my defense here. You know, emails didn't even come around until what year? 
When did you start sending emails? When did people start doing that? Uh, man, I would say 93, well, uh, normal human beings, like 94, 95. I think I caught on somewhere in the late 90s. Do you know my database were index cards when I started out in the business? Yes. That I believe. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was gonna say, we just interviewed Greg's dad, who's been in the business since 1970, and he was educating us on what the MLS book looked like in those days. So, yeah, yes, that I can believe. I can, okay. I can believe it. Okay. You didn't expect me to say, us to say yes. We're like, no, Patrick, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good lord! So you started doing, so you started doing the email follow-ups, and you started, you know, when it comes to I, coaching. Honestly, and, no, I didn't start doing anything right until 1996. I, you know, for whatever reason, I have a good personality. People like me. People trust me. They have confidence in me. So when I would get it, go on a listing pitch, I'd almost always get it. And I just didn't work hard at the business. And then I went to my very first conference in 1996. It was a Cobalt Banker conference. And I saw how people were really working at their business as if it was a business. That's when I started saying, oh, well, I could do that, but tweak it for New York. Cause, you know, I can't hand out pies at Thanksgiving. <laughs> did, did you hear the condensation in my voice when I say that, too? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so, we picked up on that, that subtle that you laid out there. <laughs> but... But how can I tweak that in my marketplace? So, um, and the way I tweaked it was not by sending out pies at all. The, um, uh, uh, but that does lead me to what you're talking about because we want to talk about my conference. So, um, I, I have the most amazing group of people attending my conferences. I've been going to conferences for 1996, and so I've collected a really wonderful group of top producing brokers. So it's going to be in Seattle from September 26th through the 28th. Um, the speakers are all top agents uh, in the nation. A lot of them used to be star power stars. Others are from Coldwell Banker, from Keller Williams, you name it. And um, they all speak for free. And they all pay their way to come to the conference. That's how much they like it. And pretty much across the board, I'm bragging and not being humble, but pretty much across the board, they say it's the best conference of the year in terms of both content and uh, connecting with other individuals. Now, obviously, the networking is good, but the connecting almost has as much meaning as the content, or at least it does to me. This, now, these, these I, I, I will, you know, Patrick and I were both stars and star power back with Howard Britton, and when this, you, you kind of took Howard's layout and you just put it into your program, right? You had the main and you have the breakouts and everything. Yeah, I New York it. I, I New York. New York it. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm I'm not kidding, guys. I, when I used to go to Star Power and I used to go to this type of event, it is the most powerful thing you can go to because you get to pick and choose what you want. You get to come back together, get to network one on one with top agents, and really develop that relationship for referrals and you know mentorships potentially. It is a powerful event, and I do plan on attending myself. And I am truly looking forward to seeing a lot of these folks and getting getting them that getting that knowledge, that pure un un you know un you know, the knowledge that, that hasn't been stomped on and hasn't been personalized by someone else it is just, here, I am giving to you guys, go. I just, it is awesome. Everybody should sign up for this event right now. How, how do they do that, by the way? Uh, go to realestatesuccess.rocks. So instead of .com, it's .rocks. Realestatesuccess.rocks. There's a conference link. Scroll down to the schedule and look at how impressive and wide... Uh, spread the schedule is there's something there for everyone. Uh, we have some incredible uh, keynote speakers. I'm just I'm just really excited. David Osborne, right, is the main keynote. No, David's not the main. David David's a good friend of mine, and uh, David and I've traveled on. We've traveled to Bhutan together and Argentina together with his family. Um, no, I'm not paying David. I there are two keynotes. He's going to hate me for saying that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, two, the two keynotes are authors. One is Hal Elrod from the okay. Miracle Morning, and Dr. Fred Gross from uh, Black Belt of the Mind. Hmm. Very cool. Good crew. Yeah. Oh, and and you know everybody else. Like we have some of the top speakers in the industry. Uh, in addition to David, who's who's just an amazing human being. Um, there is Ashton Gustafson, Lee Brown, Alexis uh, Bolin. We have really some of the top-notch uh, uh, speakers. And we're going to start it off with something really, really fun. We're starting it off with a script-off. So we're taking four of the top persuaders in the nation, which are Todd Crockett, 
Alexis Bolin, Lee Brown, and Judy Markowitz here in Queens, New York. And they're going to do a script off on handling objections, and we're going to have a winner. It was done once at Star Power a long time ago. It's so much fun. It'll be a great way to launch the, uh, the uh, conference, and you'll get a lot from it on, on how to handle objections. That very cool. awesome. That's very funny because cool. we were thinking about doing something very similar over Google Hangouts, a script off between two agents where the audience can vote on the winner. That's a great idea. Don't have me do it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'll That's take that in mind. <laughs> so don't, don't invite Patrick to script off. Okay. okay. Um, I'm, not, so I'm, this... not, I'm not that good at that stuff. I'm really <laughs> That's but a good idea. You are really good on podcasts. I want to make sure that we get, because we've just got like one minute or two minutes here left. But uh, So not only can they check out the conference at realestatesuccess.rocks, but that's also the home of your podcast, right? Yeah, it, you can get to the home of the podcast from there. It's just, Okay. I, we had to use a different format for the podcast because that's a Wix site, and we needed a WordPress site for the for the podcast. Gotcha. Yeah, but that's so that's how uh, you know we all met Patrick. Patrick interviewed Greg McDaniel, uh, so there you can find Greg's episode on Patrick's site. But more importantly, subscribe on uh, on iTunes. I think you're on Stitcher as well. Yep. Um, you know, I always that, I always call it Sketcher. I can never remember. Sketcher. <laughs> That's it's right. so sketchy. <laughs> That's right. So go to the mall, go to the nearest Sketcher store available, and subscribe to that. No, podcast. I think on Romulus, that's the name of Stitcher, it's Sketcher. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I would do. <laughs> Oh my goodness! Do you All like right. my Do you like my flowers in the background? Oh, that's that's a that's an orchid that hasn't bloomed in three years. Isn't that nice? That's very nice. Very colorful. Very green. Nice. Very charming. green. Very calm. <laughs> I'm very calm right now, just because of the plant in the room. <laughs> Oh, man. All right. Well, this is seriously one of the most fun episodes. Yeah. I don't think I've laughed this hard on a live episode. Me and Greg <laughs> laugh like this behind the scenes all, literally all the time. We cannot shut up, and we have to spend at least 20 minutes BSing before we actually record anything. Um, but this is probably the most fun I've had live on a podcast. So this is awesome, Patrick. Well, Sorry. Matt, I've got to say I'm really impressed because I, you got Greg to like shut up for long periods of time, <laughs> and I don't know that anybody's ever had that skill in their life. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, hey, if I can, uh, if I can just figure out how to turn that into a saleable product, I guarantee you there's 20, 30 people in Greg's life I can sell that to. Oh, oh God. <laughs> My, my, my team manager, Eileen Landon, she sits uh, right behind me over here, and I'm always talking, as you guys both obviously know, and not everyone viewing this knows, and I'm, uh, I'll turn around and be like, hey, Eileen, did you, what did you think about that last comment? She's like, hmm, I actually just tuned you out. What were you saying? So she would be the first in line to buy this, I guarantee you. All right, so info product coming down the pipe, seven steps to shutting Greg McDaniel up. Oh, uh, that's never going to happen. I got way too much fun stuff to talk about. Besides, hanging out with people like you guys is what makes me get up in the morning. Step number one, duct tape. <laughs> <laughs> Step two, apply. <laughs> uh, this is what makes awesome, this, this podcast awesome. Oh. Thanks for having well, me Patrick, on, you guys. Thank, yeah, thank you once again. I really appreciate it. So yeah. hopefully everybody goes and, and checks out both the podcast and the conference. So oh, we'll, oh, we'll be oh, there. Oh, can't wait. oh, we can end too. By the way, if you have a referral for New York City, um, uh, we take all price referrals. So go to patricklillyteam.com, L-I-L-L-Y, patricklillyteam.com, and send us a referral, and we'll send you a great referral fee. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you don't have that a personality awesome. or anything. Holy mackerel. Uh, oh, good I'm going to have a smile on my face for the rest of the day after this. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Oh, our pleasure. All right. All right. We'll see everybody on the next one. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube's, iTunes, uh, YouTube. You, iTunes. YouTube. YouTube? I did. Greg, you did that to me. You I did, did that. that. YouTube. <laughs> YouTube, iTunes, and Stitcher. All right. Thanks so much, guys. We'll see you on the next one. See you,